Ms. Stuart McWilliams, currently a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. He went to Edinburgh as a Chancellor Fellow. For that, he was at GL. So we're going to do a little discussion of Dr. Fink. Remember him? He was mostly in the analysis lab, but now he's in lots of people. It was very difficult to find him. But I get to use him now. As a gap for him. Before that, he was in the operating room. He was in the operating room. So he has interest in physical materials at high pressure, inflammatory science, excuse me, inflammatory science, undergraduate degrees in physics. Now he's teaching, but he just said it was easy physics, not what it happened to be. But he has broad interests that overlap with the talking about the work that he's doing. So a lot of results at the bottom right. Some of the most exciting ones in my life. Well, I hope so. And I also hope that some of these are exciting to you. Some of it will be rehashing a bit of old news. But I'll try to talk about the most recent stuff I've been working on at Edinburgh and around the world at different other facilities. Of course, I've been working with Alex and Carnegie you know, sort of really closely until about two years ago. And I realized I'd spent so much time in these on these grounds that when I walked in today, two years out, it was almost like a shock. I was so used to spending time here so uh, until just recently, mainly because I have kids and I have to stick around now in the UK. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a, a range of different measurements, uh, transport properties sort of as a catch-all concept for uh, the transport of, of, of heat, electrons, uh, the, the electronic properties of materials, optical properties, and so on, uh, viscosity, kind of all in this little uh, sort of uh, encapsulated in that, that term. And then uh, similarly, or more briefly, talking about uh, looking at structural studies uh, on very fast time scales. And uh, so uh, mainly just going to talk about what most or many of you already would, would recognize to be the different high pressure and temperature experimental techniques that are being used in the study, uh, so shock waves and uh, diamond anvil cell type things. Uh, I'm going to rehash very briefly thermal, thermal transport measurements, uh, which many of you probably are quite familiar with. And there hasn't been much development in this area uh, uh, recently, so there's not much to say about it. Uh, I'll talk about insulator metal transformations. Uh, uh, this is my first part of talking about insulator metal transformations. This is using diamond cells to heat up insulators till they turn into metals. And I'll uh, jump, I'm going to kind of tease you to you pay attention to the last part which we're going to talk about metallization and hydrogen. So I try, try to keep you awake, keep it, keep it at the very end of this talk. Uh, and I'll talk about recent studies about a viscous transport in the diamond cell, uh, following on from uh, a long history of looking at fluids moving around in the diamond cell and asking, can we make measurements using this flow? And uh, for example, viscosity. And then I'm going to talk about sort of, a, sort of the cutting edge of x-ray diffraction measurements at very fast time scales on extreme materials. Uh, that is still in my slides. That's Tim Strobel uh, sitting in for a, a real scientist here. Uh, and uh, this is still one of my best picture I ever took. So sorry, Tim, you're still front, right, and center. Um, so the techniques I'm going to talk about, of course, we know static compression techniques to create high pressures and high densities. And of course, we kn we're also familiar with dynamic compression, such as a shock wave, uh, to create a compression wave that applies high, pr high density high pressure and high temperature uh, simultaneously. And of course, my, my classic slide, many of you have probably seen this too many times. Uh, this is how much it would take to take a diamond. If you have a diamond with a tip that's one millimeter across and you sit five elephants on top of it, um, that would create the pressure in the center of the Earth, uh, uh, 360 gigapascals. And the shock wave, it's not really uh, how, how much ma weight you're applying, but the speed. The velocities, so in this case, you fire an elephant at 22,000 meters per second, and you create pressure in iron at the center of the Earth. Uh, so diamond cell techniques, of course, we use the, the, the diamonds to create the high pressure and density. 
and use a, some kind of heating approach to create the high temperatures. <coughs> to create the high temperatures. And the basic technique, now probably been talked about ad infinitum by Alex and so on, uh, would be uh, generally applying some kind of laser heating. We use pulsed laser heating because we want to minimize the, the risk of damage to the sample uh, uh, for these very high temperature experiments, for example. And uh, we apply some temperature and uh, create a hot spot inside of a micron, at a micron scale. And simultaneously, we'll probe it, say, for example, looking at the thermal emission to get the temperature that comes out of this. And of course, looking at this on a nanosecond time scale. And uh, similarly, we're trying to look at, for example, the optical properties. Say we shine a light through this, this vesicle, this hot vesicle, to look at its uh, optical and electronic properties, such as absorption and conductivity. Now, of course, the shock wave doesn't really matter what it's, what, 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 uh, this, uh, how massive the object is you're firing in this case. It matters what it's made out of. Oops, sorry, that didn't work. Uh, and so basically, it's water versus iron. When you, when you slam these two together, this is kind of a plate impact approach. You create two shock waves, and that gives you the extreme conditions. And the technique I use and have been using uh, I, uh, I, uh, for many years when I was just working at GL, I got out of this area uh, and was kind of indirectly working on these. But more recently, getting back into this, it's getting very popular these days, laser-driven compression experiments. So you take a laser, whoops, too many different buttons at once here. Uh, you take a laser, you fire it at a surface, create a plasma. The plasma explodes off the surface. The recoil uh, of atoms going one way requires, by conservation of momentum, atoms to go the other way. That produces this, sh this very rapid compression wave into the material of the target. And that compression wave will travel along. As it does, you can observe it with optical techniques. So for example, measure its, uh, the velocities that are of this motion. That gives you, for example, pressure. Uh, you can measure temperature, thermal emission, uh, and also look at the optical properties to give you, for example, electrical conductivity uh, by looking at how much light is reflected or transmitted through this material. And uh, of course, we can also now apply very high brightness x-ray approaches to uh, uh, do, a, for example, a diffraction experiment on this material while it's happening. So I'm going to kind of cover a kind of a grab bag of different uh, uh, approaches using shock waves and static compression uh, and, and, and some of the results that we've got out of this. Uh, this is uh, a slide I saw that I've kind of refurbished from uh, Vladimir Fortov, who showed the classic, this classic uh, um, 1760 image uh, and likened it to the, uh, you know, a shock wave. So of course, we have the shock speed. That's the speed of the wave. And then there's some material moving behind it. That's the particle speed, so the, the, the speed of matter behind the wave. And these are related to pressure vol density and, and the energy in that system and also the temperature in that system. So basically, you create a sudden jump in the pressure, the density, the energy, and the temperature uh, through these, the, a shock wave. And you can also do different types of waves, where instead of having just a giant shock wave, you have a bunch of little tiny ones. And they create much more gradual uh, changes in the conditions. And I'll be talking about that a little bit today. Uh, and the, the transport properties that, of course, I've talked about creating the conditions. We also want to make measurements of, of certain, for example, the, the structure of the materials of these conditions, or as I discussed, the transport uh, properties of these materials, uh, such as the optical properties, thermal transport properties, and viscosity. OK, so it's probably the thing people would recognize the most from recent work that we've done. This is, of course, out of Alex's group here at Carnegie. Uh, and hasn't changed much in the last couple of years. We were hoping for some more action in the field, but people are a little bit spooked by the, by the experiments. Uh, we have the predictions of thermal conductivity um, from theory uh, uh, recently in the last, say, five years or so, uh, finding very high thermal conductivities for iron in the Earth's core. And this has a number of geo geodynamic consequences, uh, sort of defining the, how the magnetic field is formed, how old the inner core is, uh, and how we understand the, the operating conditions of the geodynamo. And uh, this, these high values over 100 watts per meter Kelvin challenged uh, some more longstanding empirical or semi-empirical estimates of thermal conductivity, which was significantly lower than 100 watts per meter Kelvin. So um, and of course, what we did is we used a laser-heated diamond cell 
we, shoot, we shine some lasers in to heat up our sample and then apply a little laser pulse on top of the existing heating that's going on. And then so we heat up our sample, create a little thermal disturbance which propagates through the material. We can measure it on, say, two sides of this foil and model this with a finite element approach to get an accurate estimate for the, a relatively accurate estimate uh, for the thermal conductivity of this, uh, the material. Uh, and so these are the results that we got. And again, I wish that I could say more about this, but we have some ideas why we get these big discrepancies. We get results down here, which are consistent with the early, uh, uh, early expectations, kind of empirical expectations. Uh, but the theory, the we kind of agree with theory a little bit. So this is at about 115 GPA. We kind of agree with theory, but diverge as we go to higher pressures or higher temperatures. Sorry, here. Uh, so then again, this is we're measuring the. Th at fixed pressure, we're measuring the thermal conduction with increasing temperature. And uh, again, this is another group measuring electrical resistivity and converting it to thermal conductivity via the uh, Wiedemann Franz law here. Uh, you can see this is a very big discrepancies between all these different approaches. Uh, and to some extent, we're, we understand that this can be partly explained by this pro constant proportionality or the Lorentz number. Uh, but that's sort of been un an unsatisfactory. Uh, uh, explanation to date. So this is still kind of a big. Uh, yeah, I think they're, they're broadly similar. Um, but only de Coker had the data set that went down to these conditions that we just compared it to. But at, wh at where they overlap, they're the same, basically, more or less. <coughs> Certainly better than the experiments agree with each other. Uh, so. Uh, also using similar techniques, we're now looking at a diamond cell, we're heating it up, and we're looking at how materials that are initially not metals, of course in the last e experiment I was looking at iron, we looked at other metals, how, they, how, how good thermal conductors they are, and of course Zach is taking the next steps into that looking at insulators. Um, and this is really important because of, as you heat up insulators, they, they no longer behave like insulators, they turn into semiconductors, they'll eventually turn into metals. All insulators will essentially go through this process with increasing pressure and temperature. Uh, at sufficiently high uh, pressures and, and temperatures. Or they'll turn into a plasma or something like a metal. Uh, so uh, the real question we wanted to answer is how do these insulators change at, at with increasing pressure and temperature? Um, and we want to know where the insulator conductor transitions are. We want to see if these insulator conductor transitions correspond with any other transitions of interest, such as melting. And we want to look at the optical properties to get a grip on what the, what the state, what the electronic state of the material is. So again, we have our, our experiment where we have our hot vesicle created inside of a diamond anvil cell with a, with a pulsed laser. And it goes up to tens of thousands of degrees, which could normally melt your diamonds. So we do it very quickly. And uh, then we probe it, see what, what, the optical proper, what the optical transmission looks like, and estimate, for example, its electrical conductivity. Uh, this is sort of early experiment that we never actually published, but this is on water. And uh, this is where shock waves used to do experiments. Uh, here, you could also do multiple shock waves. So again, creating a s a several different little waves going through a material that could create a little bit cooler conditions. And diamond cells were, it's called a reshock. And stuck down here was the old diamond cell kind of regime. But if you use this pulse technique, we could get up to these much higher temperature conditions, say 5,000 degrees in the diamond cell. And we, in this case, observe, we were hoping to see a metal. Of course, that's what we always want to see in uh, insulator metal transitions. Instead, we see this semiconducting looking material. Again, absorb in, uh, the absorption increasing with, with photon energy, uh, as would be characteristic of a semiconductor. And indeed, that's what the previous shock experiments uh, and the more recent shock experiments have seen in this region. Uh, but at least we can, we can also we can compete with these shock experiments now and get some corroborating measurements or uh, completely new measurements. So here's the case of the noble gases. Uh, you can see these squares represent previous shock experiments, which looked at the insulator, the conductor transformation in xenon and argon. You get to helium. Experiments get really hard, because getting a piece of liquid helium to start out with, to shoot with a shock wave is very difficult. Neon, it's next to impossible. However, if we prepare our sample in a diamond anvil cell and heat it up really quickly, we can actually contain the sample uh, to observe these transitions. And so we're able to see 
this kind of red insulating transition to black conducting transition across the different noble gases, and it's scaling with the band gaps. So of course up here, xenon has the smallest band gap of the noble gases. Uh, it turns into a metal relatively easily. Neon, the largest band gap, and is almost impossible to transform into a, into a conductor. And I, I'm, I'm kind of mixing up the concept of a metal and a conductor here. These are really not metallic states right at this transition. These are, again, semiconducting states uh, on the way to becoming a metal. Uh, and so we've also used the same technique to look at hydrogen. Of course, this is where the probably the biggest controversy continues to lie, uh, as it always is in high pressure. Uh, this is looking at this is sort of the, the state of the art a couple years ago, where we have a range of pressure versus pressure and temperature, a range of different uh, transformation predictions, specifically on how this hydrogen, fluid hydrogen on the lower left, will turn into metallic hydrogen on the upper right. And of course, to some people would say it's continuous, such as shockwave measurements. Uh, diamond anvil cell measurements would, si would say it's, it's, it's a first order transition occurring here. And of course, theory is predicting a first order transition somewhere in this region. This is, of course, a very not comprehensive survey of, of, of the available results, especially for theory. Um, but we, we sought to kind of put a, another data point on this and establish what was happening here. And based on our interpretation, there's no first order fan trace phase transformation in this region up to maybe 150 GPA. We see this intermediate semiconducting phase at this, this point right here. Uh, basically, what that means is it has a band gap on the order of an electron volt. And that must be between the insulator and the metal state up here, thinking very simply. Uh, so this tells us the transition is probably continuous in this region. Uh, and that's consistent with some of the other data, but not all of it. Um, so what does a semiconducting state look like <coughs> if we shine light through our, 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 our hydrogen? I called it dark hydrogen, and we got, a, we got a Discovery Channel special out of this about dark hydrogen living in Jupiter. And people are asking, is this like dark matter? Well, no, not, not really, but I'm glad you asked. Uh, so uh, it was um, basically very dark state of hydrogen when we shine the light through it at different wavelengths of energy. We see the absorption increases with photon energy. Again, this is characteristic of a, of a semiconductor-like material. But not very satisfactory, not a wide range of photon energy to study. Uh, we assume a, semi a certain model to fit this data. We don't know if that's the right model. We don't have wide enough range of, of coverage. So there's some assumptions here. And uh, <coughs> this is now getting into the more recent stuff we've done. Uh, that's our data for the band gap at about 140 GPA and about this one electron volt, this little pink square. Over here is the, at higher temperatures, at similar pressures, uh, we get the band gap is smaller. Uh, so you can imagine that it's basically closed by, that, by, this, by this 140 GPA point. And if you go cooler, these are all dynamic, these are dynamic compression measurements now. Uh, if you go cooler, then the band gap is bigger. Uh, so this is consistent with a very temperature sensitive uh, 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 band gap and an electronic state. So essentially, you heat up hydrogen, and it very quickly will, over several thousand degrees, turn into uh, a metal um, uh, in this region, with a band gap closing consistently at constant pressure. And we, we usually consider band gap closure being a, being a density effect or a pressure effect. In this case, it's definitely a, a, a temperature effect that's happening. And fortunately, these results give us confidence that these assumptions we used are valid. Um, of course, not everybody is so confident in these results. And uh, there's many views of fluid hydrogen at this point. Of course, Knudsen in 2015 found metallization at 300 gigapascals. This is work by on the other end of the spectrum by the, the Silvera group at Harvard, finding metallization down around 100 gigapascals, much, much lower pressures. Uh, and our results kind of not consistent with this one, uh, maybe consistent with this, but we weren't satisfied. So we went to the biggest laser on Earth to solve the problem. And uh, that oh, I'll show you at the very end of this talk. So uh, continuing on, uh, we've also looked more recently at nitrogen with Alex's group. And again, we see very similar trends to noble gases. And uh, in hydrogen, we see an absorption, onset of an absorbing state not a metallic state. And as the pressure goes up, the temperature of this onset goes down. So the, 
the onset of the conducting transition becomes lower and lower, but very specially uh, for nitrogen. And we're also seeing this for hydrogen now. Apparently, Alex has told me uh, there's uh, high enough pressures you start to see this strong reflectivity from the sample showing that a metallic state is formed. And this is essentially a, at the right around the melting point of nitrogen that we expected these conditions. So we think this is an insulator metal uh, solid liquid uh, transformation occurring right around this uh, melting curve at high pressures. Um, yeah. And uh, more recently, uh, I'll, I'll mention this briefly, this is uh, work on sulfur. So of course, sulfur is a material that has a high temperature metallic state that's been known for a long time. Stay below about 12 gigapascal here on the lower end of this phase diagram. Uh, we knew that there was a metallic, something like a metal up at high temperatures and various liquid phases and insulating solid and, and liquid phases down here. Uh, very complex phase diagram sulfur, believed to be maybe the most complex of all phase diagrams uh, that we, we know of. Uh, so uh, for any simple element at least, uh, a lot of metastability issues. And of course, so what we sought out to do was, was to, this is actually the first thing I did when I came to Carnegie in 2010. I put a piece of sulfur in a diamond cell. I wanted to turn it into a metal. So I stuck it in there and I shot a IR laser at it, all right? And the, the sample exploded. Okay, this is when I knew I was, I was gonna be in for a real, uh, a couple, uh, a long effort to solve these problems. Um, so what was happening there was that the sulfur was, maybe we were somewhere around here. And we heated up the sulfur uh, and it reaches a metallic state. So it goes from totally transparent to the infrared to completely absorbing in the infrared. This creates a catastrophic absorption of the, of the laser and it basically melted everything in the cell and broke the diamonds. So uh, I stopped doing that for a couple years. Later on, we tried doing this with a CO2 laser. So this is some recent work looking at CO2 laser heating. If you have a CO2 laser, it's pretty easy to do. You put your sulfur in your sample, you put your CO2 laser, and you can just watch the sample heat up and just turn into a metal, essentially, uh, right before your eyes. This little black round thing represents the target of the laser inside this initially transparent material. And that black spot is the metal, metallic liquid somewhere. Well, it's right about there, actually, I think, in this case. Uh, so, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, you, you can also see another transition. So uh, this little ring here is a little bit lower temperature around, around the hot spot. This is this uh, red liquid state, insulating liquid state. So you're actually seeing the solid, the liquid, kind of an insulator semiconductor kind of transformation here. That first ring, the inner ring, is a semiconducting liquid to a metallic liquid transition uh, right there. So you can kind of see these phase boundaries right in front of your eyes uh, using this technique. And fortunately, the sample didn't explode because um, the, the metallic state here is believed to be a very poor metal and it's not very absorptive at the CO2 wavelength. So this, this sample was a well-controlled uh, uh, heating process compared to my earlier experiences. Um, so when we did this, we started looking at where this sample turns into a, a metallic or, or, or a conducting state, uh, essentially by where the absorption goes up a lot, like here. Uh, and uh, we, we can track it down in this region where we know there's a, this transition in the, in the liquid state to about here, which is the highest point where studies had really gone at high temperatures before. There's a maximum in the melting curve, possibly here. But nobody really saw what would happen after that. And strangely enough, we, we keep tracking the onset of the metallic state. It drops down uh, somewhere in this region and then goes back up again. So we suspect, so we really want to prove, this is really strange looking. And uh, the, we really want to prove that this is actually happening uh, by using some other techniques. Uh, but it does seem like there's a minimum in the melting curve potentially in this region if we assume that this black stuff that we see over here, which is the black metallic liquid, and we see something over here that's also very absorbing we assume that's the same phase. That's maybe there, there's a minimum in the melting curve with this region. Um, but we need probably significant additional uh, experiments targeting this region down here, trying to, trying to determine this. Uh, so we're working on that now. Uh, so another recent thing we've done, we want to look at different types of transport measurements. Of course, uh, when I came to Carnegie, Reiny Bowler was here. And he's always talking about how great his melting measurements are. And you know, you can always, it's very obvious when there's melting. You see a sample convecting, right? And, uh, or flowing around. So uh, of course, you go to the old papers on this, they go back decades. 
and people would use a laser to heat up their sample, and they would see some kind of motion that looked, that looked convective. This is a qualitative term uh, that would be used to describe it. And we use this a lot to determine melting points uh, to varying degrees of success. So, and of course, this is just one kind of, this is CO2 heating over here uh, and what it might look like and what the kind of qualitative things people would see. We got a piece of water. We're heating up the water, and you see a little particle. All right, it's, it's kind of executing some kind of circular kind of motion. It looks almost like, like it's following a streamline. If there was convection occurring in that system, uh, such as this is the early sort of discussions of this by Manga and John Lowe, if there's these kind of circular convection streamlines happening in that liquid, and, and that particle is stuck inside of it, maybe you can track that convection streamline, this is particle tracking in that sample. And if you can do that, maybe you can assess something about the sample, such as its viscosity. Uh, so we set out to kind of uh, examine from a numerical point of view how we can interpret these long, long observed but poorly understood convection uh, phenomena or motion phenomena. And uh, so this is an example of just a very simple diamond cell configuration where numerically modeling convective streamlines, the color gives us the speed of the convective flow. The uh, black lines are the, uh, the streamlines of motion that particles would follow uh, in this, this particular simulation. And we can essentially track up uh, for different conditions the, the, the melted region, depending on the, the temperature in the center of the sample, and the kind of convective proper processes you have, depending on the size of your melted region, the viscosity of the sample, other, and other parameters. Um, and it's interesting to note, especially for geoscientists, this is a Rayleigh number about 10 to the minus 6. So this is, you know, typically we don't think about convection at these very tiny Rayleigh numbers. But because this is a very a heterogeneous system that the temperature gradients are going in multiple directions, so it's not a one-dimensional system. So these, this, we do have convection at these very low Rayleigh numbers, even in this in the instance. Um, and this is in recently in Journal Applied Physics. Uh, paper. Well, uh, yeah, it sort of defined it as, as the one-dimensional equivalent for, you know, it's, 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 so for example, near the axis here, it's a nearly one-dimensional uh, temperature distribution. And so very locally, you could just kind of treat it as a one-dimensional uh, system there. And interestingly enough, we actually think, if you look here, the, the convection almost dies out completely on the axis. We think that's because it almost adopts the classic Rayleigh-Bernard convection uh, kind of plan form in this region. And it, it, it's, it's inhibited strongly because it's a very low Rayleigh number. So, um, but over the whole cell, it's, there's no real robust way to define it. Yeah. What's driving this? It's not gravity. It's gravity. It's, gravity. it's thermal convection driven by gravity in this case. Yes, so the, the volume of the sample, uh, the thermal gradient is important, uh, the viscosity is important. So we were, our main goal here was to establish a relationship between these different, the gradient, the, uh, the physical properties, and the geometry. Is that something about fluctuations in the gravity of the magnetism? Uh, I, tough question. I'm glad Ryan's not here because he's already hounded me about this uh, for the last year or so. Um, so, uh, so what's what's the point of all this anyway? I mean, if we can see convection, uh, what can we what can we do with it? And of course, one thing we could do with it potentially is measure viscosity, and that's something we really is very hard to do at high pressures. These are the current state of the art uh, using a, a multi-anvil type of cell or a paracetamol cell, looking at, for example, a little sphere falling. Uh, with radiography, you can get a viscosity estimate from the movement of that, uh, that little particle. Uh, you can also do it in the diamond cell uh, to maybe 10 GPA, this technique to about 16 GPA. The problem is, at high pressures, the melting temperatures go up. It's very hard to get a sample liquid. It's very hard to make these measurements. The sample size is very tiny, so it gets smaller. So it's hard to put a little particle in there and track it accurately. Um, so the, what we're trying to do is we know that, for example, in nitrogen, we can see motion, or it's been reported, there's convective motion all the way up near beyond the melting curve, way up to these very high pressures, just as an example of one case that's been studied a lot. 
And this is where the previous DAC data were able to achieve, very low pressures and relatively low temperatures. So if we want to study, for example, viscosity in planetary interiors, being able to get data from up in this region would be very valuable. And so if we can use this, this long reported convective motion uh, to, to, to assess this, we might be able to get a viscosity out. OK, so, and this is just an example of, for example, how this depends on temperature gradient. This is essentially uh, a simple scaling relation that we build from fluid dynamical uh, uh, sort of rules or estimates uh, that relate temperature gradients or temperature differences across the sample, viscosity, the length scale of the sample, uh, some physical constant that we know over here. And so it turns out that if you, you can actually measure everything, if you can measure the velocity of the motion, and you, may, you can basically determine its viscosity mu uh, directly in this case. Uh, so let's just, uh, we haven't pushed this to very high pressures yet for, because that's quite challenging, uh, but it could be done in the future. Uh, this is doing some experiments on a sample of ethanol at about three gigapascals. We can get a very nice, large liquid region. We're heating, the, this is a kind of a crumply piece of foil that we put in there. We're heating the laser right here. The melting, the melted zone is this outline right here. And these are flow streamlines moving around very, very slowly, less than a micron per second on average. Uh, so you really have to take a video and, and kind of run on a fast forward to see any motion. Uh, but it's, it's following these, what looks like these streamlines around the exterior of the, of the cell. And uh, we can apply, say, for example, a finite element model, and we can kind of pr predict based on the geometries and the temperatures uh, what this, the, compare the flow streamline to a model. And indeed, these do look like thermal convective motions driven by gravity and the temperature gradients from the hot spot to the edge of the sample and to the diamond, diamond edges. Uh, again, we're limited in pressure because we need a bigger volume here. Uh, but this is sort of shows that the models we've done, again, this is one of these models uh, that, we, that we're doing, actually can be reproduced by the experiments and vice versa. So we, we do think this is actually thermal convection that's happening. It's not the only kind of motion, but it is something uh, that uh, can be done. So that's one type of transport measurement we hope to do in the future. Maybe iron in the Earth's core. OK. Uh, and how much time do I have left here? 20 minutes. That's just enough. OK. We'll get to hydrogen. If you guys want to get back to that. Um, but I'm going to take a little detour. Uh, uh, not a detour, but I'm going to switch into a different type of technique. Talking about diamond cell techniques, I'm going to switch back to shock techniques. Um, and looking at, again, very fast experiments in the order of nanoseconds to microseconds uh, and trying to get structural data during this time. It's a very fast evolving field, as many of you know. Um, and uh, of course, it's really following a mystery that goes back you know, 50 plus years. If you have an ex experiment where you have a shock wave going through a sample on time scales of nanoseconds to microseconds, what are the solid structures or even liquid structures that you produce during this rapid time scale? Of course, you can have metastability issues, uh, but you don't have a good probe to look at the structure. So you often have to guess at the structures. For decades, we've been guessing at what structures were, are, are actually appearing in these very fast compression experiments. Uh, one of the big questions, of course, do we, if we do an experiment in a, in a multi-anvil cell, we see thermodynamic equilibrium phases. If we do the same experiment in a microsecond or, or less, do we get the same equilibrium structures? Uh, so we're, we're finally at the position now where we have facilities which can answer these questions, and we're answering this for very simple structures, such as cubic and tetra tetragonal structures. Um, and I did do a little survey of the field and to see where the state of the art is. And yes, we're still stuck on relatively high symmetry, simple crystal structures that we're actually testing right now. Um, but a lot of materials exhibit more complex structures. You can have low symmetry crystals, like monoclinic. You can have these incommens, a lot of the elements, for example, such as metals, will exhibit these incommensurate phases uh, where you have a host gas type lattice. Um, these have a lot of different uh, diffraction lines. They're very complex. And it's not clear, or hasn't been clear, if we can really get to the, the high quality data set to study these. And of course, these are inc really found to be common in many materials under, under pressure. So we need to, to move this forward. We need to really get these very accurate diffraction structure measurements. Um, so just as an example of the case of bismuth, uh, has a couple different phases. 
over here, phase three, is this host guest phase. And phase two is this monoclinic phase here. So uh, these are not easy to, 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 to get a, uh, to identify with diffraction, much less get it, refine the structure for. So, um, and so this is just kind of brings up to date with the most recent stuff, including just last week coming out of Tom Duffy's group at Princeton. Uh, this is the case of the, the, the one of the nicer experiments coming out of the dynamic compression sector at APS doing a plate impact, sort of bullet impact experiment in synchrotron x-rays uh, on a target of essentially glass, SiO2 glass, and looking at the formation of tetragonal uh, stichovite under pressure. And this is a PRL that they wrote, and really they just answered a question that's been sitting around for 70 odd years. What happens to SiO2 glass when you compress it uh, with a shock wave? And of course, it's, uh, it's enough for a PRL. And we notice that tetragonal structure, here we go, there's one, two, three, four, five, six peaks indexed. Over here, these are kind of laser facility based experiments. Uh, you use a laser to compress your sample and also a laser to generate a backlighter or x ray source. And you can probe a sample this way. Here's the case of from tin from Laziki. Uh, here we go, we got zero GPA, we see the tetragonal body centered cubic type structures. If up here, we start to lose lines, we don't really know what we're seeing anymore. And there's a single unidentified line that doesn't really fit with any of the predictions. And this single line they're saying is diamond. Okay, so we're having a problem here. We're getting, getting to the right conditions, but do we have the right probes? Or is there, can we really say that's diamond? And it's certainly not at the quality we expect from uh, static compression measurements in a synchrotron. So what, what can we do to kind of get in that direction? Can we go beyond these very symmetric structures? Can we? Can we go beyond indexing at just a couple peaks? Uh, and that's really where this, uh, the LCLS has really come in handy. This is uh, experiments I'm doing at, at, uh, at Edinburgh with Malcolm McMahon, who's a real sort of a X-ray structure guy from Diamond Cells, who's now suddenly switched over to shock waves. And this is the LCLS configuration. You have your target, blast it with your shot with your laser to create a shock wave, simultaneously probe it with the free electron laser beam, and get a diffraction pattern here, unwrap it, and uh, see what kind of measurements you can, you can do. Uh, so this is just an example, again, from bismuth. Uh, this is a synchrotron-based X-ray diffraction experiment in a shock wave from just not too long ago, five years ago. And you can see they're saying, well, I think this is bismuth one, two, three, five. Uh, you can see this is, this is the host guest. These, are just, these aren't even peaks. These are approximately where the peaks might be in the host guest phase. This is monoclinic, I believe they're, they're, they're claiming. Uh, again, not a lot of agreement here, right? You can complicate it also by, for example, the, sorry, the ambient peak, which is always appearing. Okay, so you often necessarily are gonna have multi-phase fits even when the state you're, you've achieved is totally pure. So this isn't. Is it, is it pressure uniform at all, at, uh, It can be, it can be uniform enough, yeah. Um, so this is the recent data that Martin Gorman, the PhD student uh, from Edinburgh, who's not at Livermore, has done on very similar, basically all these phases. Uh, these are in situ, under pressure, shock experiments. Um, there's the ambient, monoclinic, and the simple the cubic, and we can definitively rule out that uh, this host guest phase, or three, which that thing, never actually forms. So these guys just guessed it was there, we know we can say very accurately it's not. It is not, does not actually happen under shock waves. It's skipped over. We're not reaching the, 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 me, the, the equilibrium state. Uh, this is a very complex structure. To go from rhombohedral to this, there's a lot of reconstruction happening. There's no time in bismuth for that to happen. Okay, and uh, this is a case from, a, from, a, from a scandium. So it's another material with a host guest phase. This is Briggs et al. PRL uh, last year. Um, and this case, we do see not only the formation of a host guest phase that was supposed to form. Here's Antimony's, uh, sorry, Scandium's host guest phase up here that we just barely reach with the shock wave conditions, which are this line here. And uh, we are able to see not only that there's a host guest phase forming, but that it doesn't, it's not a completely ordered one. We can actually discriminate these very subtle differences between these patterns, uh, which are due to the absence of order in, in the chains, in these guest, um, you look at the chain, these kind of 
lines or, or in the direction of the chains, and these are actually essentially melted chains, whereas there's, uh, the rest of the crystal is ordered. Uh, so uh, we can actually see almost complete formation of the host gas, but not quite. And this is the case, finally, from uh, antimony. There is a host guest phase of antimony, and we can finally see very clearly here, uh, and this is a Rietveld refined uh, fit to that, uh, that, the, that data, which includes all the peaks from the host guest. Of course, individual peaks can't be indexed very clearly, but you can see that we're getting the, the, the signal is very well reproduced. And again, because if it's a shock wave, even though the, the, in the states you're getting are pure, as far as we can tell, pure phases and their constant pressure temperature states, <coughs> uh, you get multiple phases appearing because shock waves generate structures, uh, for example, due to phase transition in this case. So uh, and just kind of showing the, another view of the quality of the data here, we can see from 0 GPA up to 60 GPA, uh, we can go from the, the ambient rhombohedral phase very clearly. Uh, we can see this turning into the, uh, the host guest phase here, uh, the, the, the BCC phase up here. Uh, we have an initial phase in the middle that wasn't initially identified, but it looks like a distortion of the initial phase. So this is something, again, we're not reaching an equilibrium state. We've created a whole new uh, crystal structure under shock waves. So there's no reason we have to guess at what structures we're seeing. We can see clearly what they are. We can get a refinement, and we can determine absolutely what they are, even if they're complex, oh, like these, uh, these um, incommensurate types. And of course, big honking signal from the, uh, the liquid at high enough pressures. So you clearly also can see the melting point. Of course, shock waves will heat up your sample. So you, you, would, you, know, you will you see mixed phase regions of liquid and solid. We see that too. So it's amazing with the brightness that we can get with these free electron lasers uh, and the quality of the detectors, we're now nearly at the point, or Malcolm or McMahon would argue at the point, where we're doing uh, refinements of the same quality as X-ray uh, measurements in a diamond anvil cell, for example. And just to show, talk about this equilibrium, uh, the equilibrium issue again, here's the phase diagram of antimony. Uh, and uh, of course, we reached the melting point up here. And this is the region where we're kind of comparing to uh, static measurements of the phase diagram, which we would consider to be those representing thermodynamic equilibrium. Here's antimony 1. That's the red points where we actually remain in antimony 1. When we're supposed to go into this host guest phase, uh, instead we form a metastable, weird, shock, weird phase that only appears under shock waves. We call that 1 prime. It's probably simple cubic, actually. And then very briefly, in about the same pressures, we finally will get a transition to the, this host guest phase. And if we compress a little more, we actually get, a, get the BCC phase coming in and being stable at even lower pressures than under thermodynamic equilibrium. And I'm not going to get into it, but this is basically not what you would expect based on many, many decades of, 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 of expectations and predictions and, and really simplistic thinking about how structural transitions occur in dynamic compression. Uh, so we, this is uh, Amy Coleman's PhD thesis that just is being finished right now. I think this is really exciting. OK. You might think this is more exciting. Uh, this is, of course, the most recent work uh, done by myself, uh, Russ Hemley, uh, and Alex Goncharov, and a pretty big team of people that's been working for almost eight years uh, at the National Ignition Facility to look at hydrogen, specifically the de de deuterium uh, isotope, uh, being compressed through its insulator metal transition. And we got the beam time in 2010 when I, was, when I just started as a postdoc here. We took shots starting in 2015. And in 2018, we finally get the paper, so uh, which should be coming out pretty soon. Um, again, going back to the story where we were starting at, um, we have the Knudsen paper, which actually this is, we're basically reproducing the Knudsen approach. These are these ramp curves, ramp compression curves on a dynamic compression facility up to what they believe to be the metallization point at about 3 megabars, 300 GPA over here. Uh, then, of course, we have much lower metallization points here and inconclusive results, which didn't actually see any metal states for some reason. Uh, so what do we actually do in this case? Uh, it's very similar to these fusion experiments where you have a capsule of deuterium and tritium uh, being a, a, in, a, in a gold canister. You fire a bunch of lasers through the, through the edges of the canister, through little holes, and these create a big x-ray bath, which ablates this fusion capsule 
instead of putting a little capsule inside of our canister, we just attach a little uh, target to the edge of it, and the x-rays now uh, drive this target up the pressure. This is a zoom in. It's a piece of copper, a deuterium layer, and some kind of optical window with lithium fluoride. And so we, we hit the, the beams, we drive an x-ray bath on the surface, and drive, a, again, a bunch of little tiny, you can think of them as little tiny shock waves, or little tiny sound waves uh, that are going through uh, this material and making a very gradual compression. And as it's being compressed, we're watching the, what this looks like. Is it transparent? Is it metallic, reflecting? We're looking at the, this region over here with a, with, a, with a laser that's coming from the right. And this is what, a, maybe some of you will recognize this ugly thing. This is a visor image. It's essentially a linear image of the surface in position here. Uh, and each position, uh, th that image has interfered with itself to produce an interference pattern. And that pattern will shift uh, locally depending on the local velocity. So the shifts in the position <coughs> give you directly the velocity and ultimately the pressure. And the intensity gives you the, uh, the amount of light that's being reflected from your, your sample. And so what we see here as we start to compress, this is the pressure over here. This is time on this axis. We're slowly compressing up to about this point, and we start to ramp up the pressure a little faster about here. And at about the same time, somewhere in the middle of this ramp, the sample stops reflecting, or it's very weakly reflecting. Uh, this is where it becomes essentially an, a, a semiconductor. It's absorbing all the laser light. And then a little bit later, the, the reflectivity rises up again. And this is when the sample becomes a metallic state uh, here. So we basically go through the insulator semiconductor uh, metal transition here. Um, and we can see that the pressures, there's several different equations of state. This is taking the velocity and relating it to the pressure and the temperature. The equations of state we have are pretty good. Uh, to give us an accurate pressure reading, though it's really insensitive. The equation of state is, the pressure is insensitive to the equation of state. So we know the pressure where this metallization and optical changes are happening. Uh, will be, the temperature is a bit more uncertain. So of course it's on the order of by about 1,000 degrees at these conditions. So there is a thermal uncertainty, but we're pretty sure this is in the fluid state. And we're seeing this metall metallization in the fluid. Uh, and what this looks like, these are the data points we have. Um, I think there should be another one somewhere down here uh, more recently. Uh, so this is the, uh, the positions of the metallization point where the reflectivity rises up to about 30% reflection, which we, which we believe characterizes the metallic state. Now, where are the other predictions? This is using almost the same technique, the same material. This is Knudsen's prediction, a megabar higher. And this down here is the diamond anvil cell prediction uh, based on uh, uh, optical observations on, on pulsed heating in the diamond cell. Uh, and so we see we're kind of splitting the difference between these, probably just adding more to the controversy. But I really believe this is the most detailed and probably the best look we've had yet at the location and the nature of metallization. These experiments are extremely expensive and high quality, and the analysis is, is uh, it wasn't done by me. And I can say these guys are really uh, have done some amazing analysis. Uh, is really the state of the art. Um, oh, it doesn't mean it's right. It just means this is about as good as it gets for today. Um, and one of the things we see here is that on either side of the, this metallization point, there are a lot of gradual changes in the conductivity and the optical properties over hundreds of GPA. So, and we even think that this metallization point is probably a first order phase transition, as theory has predicted. But the, there's so many gradual changes in the insulating state to the left and the metallic state to the right it's actually quite hard to tease out where that phase transition actually occurs. And this suggests that some of the previous experiments uh, were probably seeing different features of this transition, but need to be potentially reinterpreted. So for example, this is where Silvera Group sees the onset of optical reflectivity uh, to a metallic level in their uh, pulse heating experiments. It's actually much higher than where they thought their metallization point was. So it's potentially, uh, there's, there's there's room to reinterpret some of the previous measurements uh, and, and see that we're kind of consistent with those. But we know that's not actually going to happen very fast. There's more data being produced all the time. And, uh, uh, but I really think this is probably one of the best, if not the best, thing that's been collected to date. Uh, maybe besides the earliest measurements in Nellis, which are up here, uh, showing the, the insulator metal transition to fluid. Or we hope. So 
The time scale is uh, between the two dynamic measurements is on the order of a couple nanoseconds to on the order of 100 nanoseconds. Shorter time scale. Yeah. So time scale is a really good question. And it's, uh, it's one that's been haunting hydrogen, uh, especially in shockwave science, for, for, many, for decades. And we don't have a good answer. We assume everybody has the capability on the nanosecond or longer time scale to see thermodynamic equilibrium states. But it's a good question whether that's true or not. So, yeah. Um, OK, so that's the end of my talk. I think I went long. Um, oh, not too long. Uh, quite a few collaborators from all over that uh, in, a, in a big mix of projects here. Um, got plenty here that were at Carnegie or have moved on from Carnegie. And I just found that Sergey moved on to the Hemholtz in, in Europe, so I'm looking forward to meeting him back over there when I go home. So uh, many of you might know my wife, who helped on some of these projects, uh, the Nature paper on, on iron thermal conductivity and also convection. She did all the models for convection. Um, these are our kids, and we, of course, met here at Carnegie. Some of you know these guys. Uh, some of you know us. Uh, but please come to Beer Hour on Friday to say hello. Uh, Tim, you particularly have been asked, been required to show up. So yeah, OK. Um, thank you very much. I think it, you have to jump into the laser heating approach because it's the only thing that can create the large enough thermal gradients so that the, the, the velocity, the, the, the vigor of convection is proportional to the, the, the temperature gradient. So you really need temperature gradients in the order of 1,000 degrees per micron. And that's actually crucial to see this thing on the time scale of a laboratory experiment. And even then, it's, almost, it's very hard to see this motion. So um, yeah, I think. There, there is scope to say do resistive heating to get up to the right temperature and then use a laser to create a temperature gradient uh, in the sample, for example. But um, well, it's in principle, it's in, it could be included in, in the finite element models. Um, so you have to make some, some assumptions about the boundaries in the models and could build that into the model. And a lot of the, the motions we see are away from, away from the walls. And they're, yeah, they're, there are wall effects, but we, uh, we assume they're, they can be accounted for. Um, so. so we're keeping on this. Calculate the viscosity. How important is it that you characterize the thermal structure very accurately? And can you do that on a dynamic? Because uh, I've, I've observed in my experiments. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, you need a pretty stable temperature field. But not doesn't necessarily need to be that stable. I mean, you can you can deal with some instability. Uh, the motion just will speed up and slow down a little bit if there are these fluctuations. Um, what would be worse is if you have the actual melted region changing in size and shape and time. And right. uh, I think that's, that's where it, so this was very stable uh, melt boundaries here. I think that's actually critical because the process of melting itself will produce volume changes. And this could drive a lot of the flow that happens. Um, so if you read our paper uh, here in Journal Applied Physics, we go through a pretty a big laundry list of the other things that can cause the motion and that probably need to be accounted for in any real uh, experiment. Uh, it was quite hard to find a system that performed ideally for this purpose. Um, but what we wanted to do is show that it can happen, that convection isn't just something we've, we've, we, we think we've seen. It is something that can be seen. And I think this is the first time that's been shown. So.
follow up on your yeah. the in situation? Well, in principle, this is, uh, sorry, uh, this is totally molten region here. So we don't consider there to be a, temper a pressure gradient in that region. The reason is that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, the you can cr you can have pressure gradients. For example, if you if you had so that the melt boundary was moving around or changing in shape and time, you'd produce pressure gradients just from that potentially, and they'd be huge compared to the the, the forces that are driving the convection. Uh, so, um, but at least in the steady state limit, we assume there's no pressure gradients in the liquid, and that's kind of critical, um, I think. So. Right. So the, the models we performed here have the sort of the classic orientation or the traditional orientation. The gravity is on the axis downward. And uh, in that case, we did that in part because it, it looks a lot like traditional Rayleigh Bernard type convective system with la plain layer convection. Uh, we wanted to make comparisons to this sort of more simpler case, such as calculating a Rayleigh number and so on. Um, so in this case, yeah, we have this is the flow plan form. And you're looking down from the top or the bottom at, uh, at this, these motions. This is not exactly ideal. Uh, so the experiment we did is actually, again, I have to thank my wife for actually knowing how to do this. Uh, this is done in, that's with the, the gravity is now pointed in a radial direction. So the cell is oriented sideways. And you're looking uh, directly through the sample this way uh, from, you know, into, the, into the screen here. And in this case, the motion is actually essentially uh, perpendicular to your viewing direction. It's a much more ideal way to look at the motions, actually. Uh, and also, it's the way most laser heating systems are configured in the present day. Uh, the models are very different, are, are, are pretty different, but you can do it. If this requires three dimensions, that's the main complication. It takes, it's more difficult. That's, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, and, and you do. The models, are, the models are very different. So uh, for a number of subtle reasons, um, you get faster speeds is one thing. Uh, and yes, we, we do have to adapt the model to either a sideways orientation or a vertical orientation. It would be interesting to be able to continuously change the orientation, maybe, and, and use that to, as, a, as, a, as sort of a, a parameter in the system. Uh, but that's, of course, not very easy to do with laser heating. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is, these more recent models we've done are 3D. They're, they're the more relevant ones from, that most people want to use, I think. Um, very hard to set up. I got to thank Ms. my wife. To, to, she did that part when we were in uh, Colombia. So. Yeah, Stuart, I, I have a question yeah. about iron. What what's your guess of what the what causes the discrepancy between the two experimental studies? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think the more I looked at these, so this is of course this, the simplest case. You have convection, but the more I looked at the other types of things that might cause motion, the other types of forces that are in play in these systems, such as surface tension. Um, it, it's, increase, it, it's, in, it's, it's increasingly likely that most of the motions we see are not convective motions, as, as you probably have pointed out in some of your papers, uh, that they're driven by other forces, surface tensions, uh, you know, melting, boundary motion, and, and so on. Uh, so in some of these motions, it could actually occur in the solid state. You could have, for example, surface tension in principle plays a role in the solid as well as a liquid. If you have a very high temperature solid, I know I, I've looked at some of Mole and Riney's really nice pictures of these nice uh, uh, spots with, uh, if you laser heat a nice metallic surface, you get nice rounded vesicles, uh, which look like molten droplets. And that droplet is the adjustment of that system to surface tension. 
in the, in, uh, during, the, during the, the belting process. But it's, it occurs to me that that same force, that surface tensional adjustment, could occur in a solid if the solid could recrystallize very quickly, for example. And we know that iron can do that. So I think it's, it's, it's pretty exotic once you get up to these very high temperatures. And I think we're talking about solids at almost an electron volt temperature. We don't really know much about the, the, the mechanical properties of solids at these conditions. This is really, I think it's an unrecognized. Uh, Can you speak about pressure for a moment? Yeah. I, well, our, our measurements failed once we had, once we got anywhere near melting point in those measurements. Probably for this reason or something like it. So I think there's a lot of exotic things to look at in liquids at high temperatures and high pressures. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And that might be at the root of that difference. The last result is very interesting. Now what we have is three different results. So what do you see the future? And how <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and it's, it's going to be a while before we, for anybody comes to an agreement on this. Um, I think it's, it's, you have to look at everything together and try to find the most consistent, self-consistent data sets and the data sets that make the most sense with other pieces of information. And I think that consistent. Uh, it, it's, it has a lot of observations that are consistent with static measurements, by and large. And I think if we, if we can convince Ike Silvera to you know, loosen up his, uh, his hard-nosed uh, interpretation of his data, I think it may, very, well, very well maybe that his results might be consistent with this, for example. Um, and, but I think it's, it's very complex, and, and it's going to be difficult to decide what the correct thing is. There are conspicuous discrepancies, for example, and I think the thing we can talk about the, the most directly would be the difference between the Knudsen measurements and the NIF measurements. Uh, these both observe the onset of the semiconducting state right about here at these gray and black curves. So we see the sample goes black, deuterium goes black at the exact same conditions between the, 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 the Knudsen data and the NIF data. Uh, the difference is these measurements, the reflectivity goes away completely in the inter inter intermediate regime. The reflectivity is almost zero. And then suddenly it jumps up again out here. Uh, whereas in the, the NIF case, the reflectivity stays on the order of 5%, 10%, and then ramps up to a, a level we think is characteristic of a metal. And so essentially, what this means is this, they lose track of their reflectivity. They no longer measure optical properties in this intermediate regime. Uh, and we've come up with a number of possible, and in some cases I think they're a little bit crazy, explanations for why that is. Uh, in interestingly enough, the Livermore uh, team, especially Peter Sellier, seems to think that there's really huge pressure gradients that drive a turbulent convective motion and that they wash out the, the probes that are going through the sample at this point in, in, in this case. While the sample's being shocked, the argument is that there could be a big pressure gradient that drives a turbulent convection, and dr it, r it kills the contrast in your probe, and so you lose the signal altogether from your sample. And that is what it looks like in this case. There's a big gap in the signal in the critical region where we see the metallization happen. So um, I think that's, that's one of the issues that's outstanding. Um, now, Marcus will come maybe in a month or two and have a whole other reasons, a whole, whole list of reasons why the NIF experiments are, are the, have their own problems. So uh, yeah, I, we, we've given him this paper draft uh, early because we really want to dig into this uh, as soon as we can. Um, I think normally shocking experiments are more consistent than this. So this is going to be a real mystery uh, to sort out. That is the argument that time scales are shorter, the length scales are smaller. And so the, 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 this, this possible flow process wouldn't happen. Um, so. But there's other technical issues I think are important too. It's very difficult to measure reflectivity in these experiments. So um, which one? Is 
just what we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at your your activity plot, so um, I mean it's not obvious that that corresponds to your Visar image on the left. Is that coming from the same image, or that's a separate measurement? So yeah, this um, this is. Yeah. Um, it's really dark, isn't it? But well, what's the difference between the left one and the dashed line? <coughs> dashed line and the solid line. Let's see the difference. Because the solid ones have the same length. You know that I don't know the difference between those two, actually. I don't think about it. Um, you know, the argument that you're making no equation, right? Yes. Like yeah. If you really so. had a very strong source center, I mean, it was one very material. Well, that's just you expect it to be a very sharp thing. To it's see. just what we're arguing is that there, there could we don't actually have the, the resolution to see if there's a sharp phase transition. It's possibly this little blip right here. Uh, as I said, actually. There's gradual changes in, the, in the, these properties that are happening all around this point. And actually, the most recent theory, for example, by Pierre Leone, has predicted very similar properties. If you look at their, their evolution of the electrical properties of the system, there's massive orders of magnitude changes on either side of this first order transition. And the first order transition is actually kind of small compared to the, 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 the larger changes. In the, yeah. It's 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 not a it's it's not a strong. We say it's probable for for a number of overlapping reasons, but we don't say we can we we can con yeah, definitively say it's that absolute. Well, in this case, we're putting it at thirty percent optical reflection, which for a number of reasons indicates to us that there's a metallic conductivity, I mean, a, a minimum metallic conductivity. Well, it's a it's a metallic state somewhere up here. Uh, so, yeah, that's the um, whether there's a first order transition. We don't we don't know. We uh, the editor and in, in, uh, it's under review now. But the editor was wanted us to talk more about that for reasons that are obvious. Um, but I think it's more important, in my opinion, that there's a lot of gradual changes that you ha and these these will make it very hard to spot a first order transition, even if it is present. And that's what the most recent theory would actually predicts. So uh, I think that's pretty important here. All right, let's thank Stuart and have lunch too. In a few minutes, let's come over to have some of these. Uh, sure, yeah, okay. Wait, um, where do you want to go to dinner? Yeah, the, the sulfur one, uh, really. the one I'm most interested in.